All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kimberly Young, and I am the education coordinator for the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwartzman Animal Medical Center. Um, so I know that there are those of us who are tuning in that come to many of our lectures in our series. And you might notice that the director of the USDAN Institute, Michelle Leifer, is absent this evening. Um, unfortunately, one of Michelle's family members recently passed away and she cannot be here with us tonight. And so um, on behalf of the Animal Medical Center, we just wanted to express our condolences to Michelle and her family um, and our thoughts are with them during this difficult time. I would like to thank all of you for joining us for tonight's event, Making a Plan for Your Pet with Deborah Hamilton. Tonight's event will be recorded and we will send out a link to the recording tomorrow in case you miss anything or like to share with a friend. We'll be taking questions via the chat box and we'll be sure to save some time at the end of the presentation to answer as many questions as possible. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Deborah Hamilton is the Principal Attorney at Hamilton Law and Mediation in North Carolina. Hamilton Law and Mediation uses Understanding-Based Alternative Dispute Resolution, or ADR, methodologies to transform disagreements between people over animals. Deborah facilitates discussion among the parties, helping provide them with neutral guidance that allows for the opportunity to choose peaceful conversation over litigation. Deborah is also an international speaker and best-selling author of Nipped in the Bud, Not in the Butt, How to Use Mediation to Resolve Conflicts Over Animals. She is a co-author of Onward and Upward, a guide for getting through New York divorce and family law issues. She has an internationally received podcast, Why Do Pets Matter, and holds an international pet planning community call, The Map Plan, Wednesday evenings. The Map Plan helps community members navigate the journey their pets takes when they can't care for it. And finally, Deborah owns, breeds, and shows Irish setters and long-haired standard dachshunds under the prefix rum reason. We are so grateful to have her with us to lead tonight's presentation. Please welcome Deborah Hamilton. Thank you, Kim. This has been such an honor to be asked, and I want to thank everyone at AMC um, for asking me to do this program for your community because it is so important to navigate the journey your pet's going to take if you can't care for it. We don't necessarily ever um, take a minute to do that, but we're going to tonight, and um, I'm so glad that you're all here. There's a large number, and I'm thrilled, beyond thrilled. I see a few of my uh, MAP community members here as well, our Wednesday night group, so I want to have a shout out to them. And um, Kimberly or Marie are going to put up the five questions I want to ask before I say a word, because I want to know where all of you are in your pet planning uh, right now before I give you some information that might help you either change it or maybe you've got a great pet plan, but this way um, you'll give me honest answers without anything uh, being swayed by what I tell you tonight. So uh, Marie, if you put those up, there are five of them. They're very short. It's a yes, no, or I don't know. Okay. Did we get everyone, uh, Marie, or did I hit the wrong button? Okay. And then the next one. How much money should you leave for your pet's care? Great. Thanks, Marie. The next one. Do you have a pet trust set up to care for your pets? Next. Who will care for your pets if you get sick, which means you're not dead yet, um, you're just sick.
And I think I'm counting right, Marie. That was five, or is there one more? Ah, there's one more. Do you have written directions for the care of your pet? Written meaning actually written down in a form someone can find and use. Awesome, thanks, Marie. We're almost done, great. So now I'm gonna take the polls down. I'm gonna share my first screen. Um, I think Kim, you're gonna turn that on. If not, I'll be happy to share it again. Uh, yes, if you could turn that on, that would be great. Yeah. And um, if all of you could do me a favor and, uh, I don't wanna share the results. So uh, Marie, just pull that down if you would, um, the poll. I'll get it, there we go. Um, if if you have questions, the chat I think is enabled. Um, so Marie or Kim will uh, monitor the questions so that at the end we'll ask questions. I like to keep going through, but if somebody has a pressing question um, and they ask it a few times, then uh, we'll make sure that uh, I see it. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to pull this down. There it is, because I want to I want to disappear. Uh, so this is called the map plan for a reason. You're going to navigate the journey your pet takes when you can't care for it. And I'm telling you, this is a very important uh, process that you have to go through. And the reason I built it was because uh, I didn't have a plan. So I was where you are uh, in 2013. So here's all my bio and things. I'm sure that the um, AMC is going to share this. Uh, I'm very involved with, you know, communications uh, between people with animals and their veterinarian, their kennels, their groomers. It just is something that's so important to me to have less adversarial conversations and more collaborative conversations. So I'm I'm a little busy, but I was out of New York. I was in New York and I was a client of the Animal Medical Center for many years. Uh, now I'm in North Carolina and believe me, the hardest thing for me to find was a veterinarian. So I've had dogs and cats and birds and horses for my entire life. I they were a part of my life. That's my horse Art in the center sticking his tongue out because he's naughty. And those are my dogs Atticus and Mariah sitting on the dock in Maryland. And uh, there's my son's cat Jane. So I've had all these animals in my life um, for the better part of my life. And uh, they were very important to me. So like you, I didn't take a lot of time to think about who would care for the pets if something happened to me because we're all invincible. There is absolutely nothing going to happen to us that will ever make us incapable of taking care of them. And by the way, no one can take care of them as well as I can, so why really look? Uh, and then reality struck in a big way. I broke my ankle in 2013. I was out in the snow, slipped, fell, um, looking for one of the dogs, I might add. And I broke my ankle and sat there and went, oh my God, um, what's going to happen next? What I learned about my invincibility was, and some of you might be able to relate to this, is that my dogs exercised out in the backyard. The exit they used to the backyard was from the basement. And if any of you have ever broken your ankle, getting down a flight of stairs with a broken ankle is pretty difficult. My dogs also were fed downstairs because I separate them all and they all have their own space and I love them. And so they ate in the basement. Uh, my husband and family informed me they were caring for me while I was recovering from a broken leg. They love me. However, they were taking care of me um, and they were not going to take care of the dogs. Uh, and who was going to take care of my dogs? Oh my God, not a good time to be thinking, holy Toledo, there's nobody here to take care of my dogs. Now I did have someone who came and sat with the dogs while we traveled and I called them and they were able to come some of the time. And then my husband and my kids stepped up some of the time. But the biggest thing that came to me in that moment was I really hadn't written down a plan for the care of my pets. There was no one who knew what I did every day 
to care for my pets because like you, I do everything. I bathe them, I wash them, I feed them. I know who gets what, I know who gets along with who, I know who's afraid of thunder. I know who gets medication. No one else knew all that. Some of them knew some of it, but not all of them knew all of it. And it was really a wake up call for me. In fact, the beginning of this, this program, when I started in 2013, it was called I'm Not Dead Yet, because we sometimes plan for the care of our pets when we're dead. But if we're not dead, those plans don't come to fruition. So it's something that we have to think about both dead and alive. So I want you to ask yourself, if you don't make it home, what's going to happen to your dog, your cat, your bird? I mean, birds are really hard. Horses, who's gonna take care of your horse? I mean, lizards and snake and fish, my God, they're, they really do have a specific kind of care. Most people are only worried about the dogs and cats. But as I sat and made this program, a lot of the members of my MAP community have lizards, snakes, and fish. And during Superstorm Sandy, they lost electricity. And what do lizards, snakes, and fish need? They need heat, so do birds. So they didn't have heat. They didn't have electricity. It was really something that they went, oh my God, I really need to know what to do when something like this happens. So I call these life-altering issues that we often leave completely unconsidered, um, the 10 Ds. And that's my dog Atticus. He's now 10, no, I think he's 12. Um, and he's out on the Chesapeake Bay there. He's a, a lovely guy. So the 10 Ds that nobody ever thinks about. So if you get divorced, the New York State has now created a new legislative rule that judges will decide who gets your pet if you can't decide on your own. And you really wanna give the uh, decision over to a judge. I mean, I would ask you to raise your hands, but I'm pretty sure no one would want to have a judge decide who got their pet. What happens if dementia occurs? What happens if you're suffering from a disease that may disable you, right? Or you're disabled because like me, you broke an ankle. What happens if you have to leave in the middle of the night because of domestic violence? Superstorm Sandy would qualify as a disaster. Anyone who flew in the last two weeks could talk about delays. Uh, most of us on this call can raise our hands and say, I'm in denial. I don't think I need a plan. Everything will work out. Uh, if you're in the armed forces, what happens if you're deployed? And then finally, the last one is, yes, what happens if I die? What will happen to my pet? So there's, don't feel like you're alone because almost no one takes care of their pets before the 10 D strike. Uh, very few make the plan and I will share with you and I love them very much. And since I'm an attorney, I can say this. Most trust and estate attorneys don't know about preparing for the 10 Ds either. They tend to ask you if you wanna put uh, money in your will to take care of your pets, if something were to happen to you. Uh, but they don't necessarily sit there and ask you to do what I'm going to ask you to do tonight, because it's really not something that they're familiar with. And because it happened to me, I'm going to share that process with you, because it really does make a big difference. Um, if you know about the Ds, you might, you know, jot down a few plans for your pet. Um, or as I said, all your pets are in the will. Uh, and as I said before, it's so important to recognize and make sure you tell your trust and estate um, guide, but I have to be dead, right? And if I'm not dead, who's going to care for my pets? And that's something that you definitely have to make a plan for. So right now you might be thinking, oh my God, I have no written plan, plan for my pets. Um, but then you might say to yourself, wait a minute. I know what I want done with my pets and I have this plan in my head and I've even talked to people about that plan. I have had a glass of wine, I've had a dinner, we've talked over the fence. Both of us have exchanged thoughts and ideas about what we're gonna do. They know they will know what to do. They will know who they are and they will care for my pets the way I have directed them because they're gonna remember about that conversation over wine or over the fence. Um, or better yet, my family will care for my pets. And your they could be your friend, a breeder, a rescue, a neighbor, a veterinarian, a dog walker, a kennel owner, a groomer, whatever. This is what we think about because if we don't have a plan written down, 
this is actually how we're thinking. And this might sound silly right now tonight that they, you know, who are they and do they really know and have we made it clear to them? Uh, likely not. And I will raise my hand that I have a husband taking care of my two dogs right now because I'm in Colorado at a conference. Uh, my sons can never take care of my dogs right now because my dogs don't get along with cats and one of my son has a cat and I'm not going to tell him to get rid of his cat to take my dogs. Uh, and the other one has an apartment that takes no, no pets. So hello, I mean, I'm in that boat with you guys. So I had to really sit down and decide what is the plan that I'm going to make for my pets. So you and I are doing this together. Or you may be thinking, maybe I should make a plan, but you just don't know where to start. And this is what I find. That's why I have the MAP community. This is what I find most of the time. People know they need to make a plan, but it is overwhelming. And so they just don't know where to start. And that's why you're here tonight, because I'm going to give you the four steps you need to do to start this so you can really make a plan by the time we're done here tonight. So that's why I'm so glad um, the Animal Medical Center asked me to come um, because all of you are just like me, just like me. And I'm an attorney who should know better, right? Um, we all love our pets um, and we want to make a plan for their short and, and long-term care. We just don't, know have, don't have any idea how to do it. And so over the past 13 years, I've sort of perfected the program so that people can actually take the time, know the words to use, know the language, um, to employ, to have people help you take care of your pets. So tonight, what we're going to learn how to do, and it's why I took the poll before, because I wanted to know where everybody was, as opposed to where they think they're going to be after we're done tonight. I don't want anybody to feel bad. Um, we're going to learn how to keep our beloved family member and companion safe, which I know for everyone here is of the utmost importance. Um, we're going to answer the questions you may have regarding how to make a plan. Uh, we're going to think about the plan that's right for you and your family, because you can't make a plan that can't be followed. So we have to be realistic when we make our plans. Um, and as I said, I'm going to provide those four steps to help you navigate that journey if you can't care for them. And that's long-term and short-term. So let's start by figuring out what we know, what we don't know, and what we need to know to plan for the care of our pets. First, what would happen to your dog, cat, bird, horse, all of my favorites, if you fail to plan? They could end up with someone you don't like. They could end up in a shelter, which happened to a number of dogs and cats during COVID. Someone could put them out on the street or worse, they could take them and have them put to sleep. So this is really something that we need to take the time to do and to do it well. Sorry, hold on, there we go. The choice to make a plan is as clear as the nose on your face. Everybody here is saying, yep, I'm gonna make a plan, yet you often choose to leave that plan unfocused because you just don't know what plan you intend or want for the care of your pet. You don't know if you wanna let it go to a family member or back to the breeder or back to the rescue or shelter you adopted it from um, or to your neighbor or to um, who knows, you just don't know what to do. Um, or you believe it's gonna take a ton of money to make such a plan and I don't have it. Um, attorneys probably need to draw up this plan um, and they're really expensive. Um, and after all that expense, how much do I need to leave to fund my animals? So the bottom line is we don't really need to have an attorney to make the MAP plan. The MAP plan is to be incorporated into your estate planning after you make it. So it is something that lives outside your will so that you can change it as your pet's needs change. So if you have a young puppy now, great. And then when it gets to be a teenager, maybe something's changed, you can change it and then just send the new MAP plan to your trust and estate provider uh, to make sure it's incorporated or at least um, in his possession or her possession so that she knows. Um, and I always say, it's, it's really funny, 
um, in your will, you can leave money for the care of your pet. However, you should really be leaving your pet to someone who isn't in it for the 10, 20 or $30,000 you might leave for the care of your pet. They should be doing it because you've had this conversation. They know exactly how to care for your pet. Um, and they're in it for the love and the care of you and your pet, not for the 20, 30 or $40,000 they're going to get to do it. You can always do that. However, you, you really want to find someone to care for your pet who's going to do it because they love your pet. So it's a question of pay me now, pay me later. later. Uh, putting money in um, a pet trust is a good way to plan for the care of your pet in the event something happens to you short term, because that money will be available to transport your pet from point A to point B, and then to help them buy a bag of food. And then if they need more food, they can go to your um, attorney and get more funding as time goes on if they're with the pet longer, if they were caring for the pet longer. Um, if you're afraid to make the wrong plan or you're gonna just wait for a rainy day to make a plan, that means nothing's gonna get done. I truly don't want you to pull the covers over your head because that won't assure the safety of your pet. Um, the other thing that people usually say is I live in the moment, I have positive thoughts, nothing's gonna happen to me. Well. I do too, and I have a plan for my pets because although I live in the present and I think life is good and everything's going to be great, I've still decided that I'm going to have a written plan for my pets. I'm going to have money set aside and I'm going to have everyone who needs to know about that plan know about it. So let's face it, no one knows your pet better than you do. You really know all their wants, their needs, their personality quirks. Um, and how will anyone get inside your head if you're unable to communicate? This is my biggest fear for all of you who are pet owners, that something occurs and you cannot communicate who you want to care for your pet, how your pet needs to be cared for. Um, it's so important um, for you to at least maintain the care of your pet. It might not be the same as um, the care you would give it, but it definitely is the care you want for your pet. So if you answered yes, then you must face the reality that if you have no plan, you appoint no caregivers and you have nothing written down, your pet status quo will be dictated by the people who step up to care for your pet. I'm gonna repeat that because if you don't have anything written down and you haven't appointed or spoken to any caregivers, um, and you haven't a plan, tell them what to do, then it's going to be up to the people who step up to take your pet. I don't know how many people have come up to me and said, yeah, I got my aunt's cat because nobody wanted it. Yeah, I got my uncle's dog because nobody wanted it. Yeah, I have to take care of this horse because, you know, the owner died. Nobody wants to take it and I haven't been able to find anybody. So it's, you know, it's living threadbare, so to speak, because there's nobody paying its bills. Um, so what you wanna make sure doesn't happen um, is that they are taken by people who aren't the ones you want. They might be abandoned. Um, they could be left unmedicated. How many of you have pets that need medication? Um, they may be returned to the shelter or rescue, which isn't a bad thing, especially if you've gotten the pet from the shelter or rescue. Uh, you have to read your contracts. Most people don't um, because you are likely required to return it to the shelter or rescue before you rehome it. That's a whole nother part of the map plan that I talk about in the long-term map plan. You have to make sure that the people who you've gotten the pet from um, will enable you to leave the pet to the caregivers that you appoint. Um, I tend to uh, let all my Irish setters go with a first right of refusal, so you'd have to call me. But there's a way to have that peaceful conversation and say, listen, my neighbor knows my dog. I live you know, two states away from you and we haven't seen each other and they'd love to take the dog. And most breeders will say, great, just let me know who they are. Because the bottom line is they don't want something to happen to the dog they entrusted to you. So they want to be the heir and the spare. So you found someone, but they want to make sure they know who that person is in case that person needs them. So if you take these four critical steps that I'm going to talk about, um, you can save your pet's life. 
These steps are all you're going to need to do to assure the future care of your pets. It's called the MAP plan for a reason, because I wanna make sure <laughs> that everyone knows they're making a MAP that someone's gonna follow to care for your pets. So the M stands for make a plan. The A stands for addressing the needs of your pet. The other A stands for appointing caregivers. And the last letter P is publish. And I have to say of all the letters, that's the most important piece because if you make a plan and you address the needs of your pet and you appoint caregivers, if you don't publish that plan so people know about it, it is not gonna be followed. So when you make a plan for your companion's care, you really are going away from the belief that your kids will take your dog, your spouse or neighbor will take the dog. These are some of the greatest misconceptions held by owners. I always tell people who go to my workshop, you know, I understand your husband's gonna take, your kids are gonna take, but make sure there's somebody else there as well because sometimes their life has changed and they can't take it and they can't tell you they can't take it. So it really is great to have at least two or three people, only one being a family member who will be able to take care of your pet. Um, when you're making these plans, throwing a broad net is so important to making sure your pets are cared for for the long term. I can tell you that in my experience, um, sitting down and making these plans are one of the most important things you can do because you want to make sure that you have a realistic plan that can be cared for, um, that your pet can be cared for under. It's not something that will be exactly the way you care for your pet, that would be great. I'd love that myself. However, if my pets are safe and well-fed and loved, uh, they may be in a house with seven other dogs, but if they are happy there and, and like it and we've tried it out, great. Uh, don't presume that your pet needs the same thing that they have with you. They might be fine with a little bit of a shifted uh, lifestyle. Did you know, and this is really important for everyone to understand, that family members are more likely to drop off the pet at a shelter than if you leave the dogs to friends or acquaintances. Um, also, if they're an owner surrender, they are euthanized earlier uh, because they're not looking for anyone to find this pet. Uh, so just keep that in the back of your mind that you know, I, I know it's sort of crazy for me to say, you know, your family might not take care of your pet, but they may not take care of your pet. And so just make sure you have an ear and a spare. They may be perfect and they may be wonderful and they might never do that to you because they know you would come back and haunt them. Uh, however, or you would, you know, be very angry when you woke up. I can tell you that um, I've had several clients who've had issues happen where they got very sick. Uh, their pets were given to other people because they didn't have a written plan. Uh, six or eight months later, they were recovered enough and went home and their pets weren't there. And they were like, wait, wait, what happened? Well, you know, remember when you said that, you know, if something happened to you, we were supposed to find a new home for your pets. We found the new home for your pet and they love him, but they're not going to give him back right now. So these are things that, that really do occur that you have to be aware of. Um, and if say a catastrophe strikes, like a fire or um, Superstorm Sandy. Um, can your family member or friend take the care of your pets um, and do that with no written directives, giving them permission? It's, it's really interesting that most people don't know that if they don't leave written directives for the care of their pet, uh, that no one will know that they have it. Uh, so, putting them somewhere where someone can find them is really key. I always um, tell new newcomers to the MAP uh, community call, I always say, just make sure tonight when you get off this call, put a three by five card on your refrigerator that says in case of an emergency, uh, please do not take this pet out of the house. Please call this number. If you can't get that person, call this number. If you can't get that person, call this number. Uh, they will take care of the pets. And 
make sure you let those three people whose numbers you're um, leaving on the refrigerator know that you've done that. I've had people uh, come to the community call who have spoken to their neighbors about things and their neighbors took it upon themselves to say, oh, well, then you'll take care of my pet too and not bother to tell them. Uh, so you really need to uh, ask permission to put them up as one of the caregivers um, and make sure your family knows who they are in case they can't take care of them. Um, when making a plan, you have to be realistic. You, know, you have to know what kind of pets you have. Um, you have to say what age they are, what their present health is, and you have to change it every year because things change, all of us know. And if you don't do it every year, okay, do it every two years, but really update it as much as you can. Um, what you want to think about is their options for care. Do you want them in a home? Do you want them to stay in your home while you're recovering? Uh, that's an issue that you have to put down. Do you want them to go to your favorite kennel or their favorite kennel um, while you're sick? Uh, the woman who uh, was sick for six months had told her friend that she wanted them to go to a kennel, told, operative word there is told, told her friend to put it in the kennel. But after two months, the friend said, well, she's you know only got a 1% chance of coming out. And so I'm going to give the dogs back to the breeder and the breeder placed the dogs. And when she came out six months later, uh, she said, why didn't you keep them in the kennel? I told you to keep them in the kennel. She said, well, I didn't think you were gonna survive. So I didn't wanna waste your money on kennel fees because it wasn't written down. Um, if you have a pet service provider, you need to make sure they know what to do. Um, that's always great if say you have a broken leg or you're going through chemotherapy, uh, or maybe even if you're starting with Alzheimer's, pet service providers um, are going to allow the pet to stay in your house as long as possible. Um, family assistance can help and outside assistance can help, but these are all things that you need to put in your plan and be realistic about both for the cost of that um, and the uh, care of your pet. If your pet goes to someone, then a fee would be paid. And if they're coming in, then you have to decide what that will be. And that's a conversation you have to have with the person, especially if they're a pet service provider or a kennel or outside assistance, you're gonna have to talk to them about what it is they um, are going to expect to come and help you keep your pet with you. Now, after you gather all this information together, you need to initiate a discussion with everyone connected to this pet. So I just touched on that, but this is reiterating that you have to have a discussion. Um, and you need to communicate simultaneously with everyone who you want or think would like to care for your pet. Because as we say in the MAP community, um, you need to have redundancy. The person, who is going to care for your pet needs to know the other person who's agreed to care for your pet needs to know the other person who's going to care for your pet because if something comes up well deborah knows to call sally and sally knows to call mary and mary knows to call connie because they all know that they are the caregivers for deborah's dogs if something happens to deborah that's something that's really important and you can only have that discussion if everyone is together and knows they exist um, and knows that they're there to be sort of a check and balance as well. There are many times when someone leaves their pets to someone and the pets are not being cared for as well as they had hoped. Without someone checking in, and believe me, your attorney is not going to do this, um, those pets might go with inadequate care for a while before anyone notices. But if you have redundancy, there's always that ability for the other caregivers to call and see how the pet is doing. Um, you always have to ask the caregivers how they feel about uh, being in charge of the pet, what they think their responsibilities could be. Um, and you have to appreciate their positions when they say, well, I'm, I'm not sure I can do this anymore. I just moved to a new apartment. I can only have a 30 pound dog and you have a great Dane that might not work. Um, you want to work toward a mutually feasible solution um, that keeps both the owner's and the pet's interests top of mind. It may not be perfect, but it'll be better than not having any plan at all. Um, so uh, Kim said at the beginning that I have Irish setters. And if you have a purebred dog, there are purebred uh, rescue groups 
that will be happy to be the last person in the line to take your pet if no one else can take it. Um, and they will make sure the pet is placed uh, in a home after it's evaluated and they'll do the best they can to know um, what's what the idiosyncrasies of this dog is because they're very familiar with the breed. But if you have a, um, a dog that doesn't have that opportunity, uh, then you're really at the mercy of whomever is going to come and get the pet um, and recognize that people might not be able to take them who said they could take them. Uh, so that's really an important piece to remember. The second point to remember is to appoint caregivers. So after you make your plan that sets forth how you want your dog or cat or bird or horse cared for, you need to, to at least have three caregivers and only one can be a family member. I know all of you are saying to me, but my family members are the ones who know my dogs. They're the ones I want taking care of my dogs. Fabulous. However, if you're the one who's sick, your family members are going to be so grateful you have someone outside the loop to care for the pets. I can tell you this from personal experience. So I broke my ankle and my family was caring for me. About 10 years later, my husband broke his shoulder. And you know what? I initiated the MAP plan, not because I couldn't physically take care of my pets, but I had to be out of the house. I had to help my husband, you know, initially, if any of you have broken a shoulder, it is a really terrible injury. I had to help him initially. And I just had that peace of mind that there were people I could rely on to give the dogs an extra walk, to come and feed them if I was at a doctor's appointment. There was just someone there who I knew and trusted who could come, even if they came three times a week. There was an appointed caregiver who knew my pet, who my pet knew, um, who had an up-to-date care list for the pet, knew what medications, when heartworm was due, everything else. Because if you don't tell somebody, they don't know. Um, and just was seamless in the ability to allow me to take care of my family member. Because remember, if you're sick, your family's going to want to be with you. I don't care who you are. They're going to want to be with you. And yeah, they'll take care of your pets, but your pets are going to have a long period of time where they're with you and they're not being walked or cared for. So it's really great to make sure you have these three appointed caregivers and some of them are not family members. So where do you find these alternate caregivers? It's not easy. I know. So you have neighbors in your apartment building or you have neighbors on the block. Or there are people, I remember during COVID, uh, my husband and I moved to a new house in Pleasantville and I knew no one. Um, and I was walking the dogs uh, as we all did during COVID. And I would see the dogs in everybody's backyard. So I made a three by five card and in every mailbox of every person with a dog, I said, in the event something happens to you or your family, this is my name, this is my address, this is my telephone number. If you need help with your dog, let me know. And I had an alternative motive for that because I wanted to know who would come and help my dogs if my husband or I got sick. And sure enough, I got phone calls. I think I gave out 10 cards. I probably got eight phone calls saying, thank you so much. We see your dogs walking all the time and it's so kind of you. And yes, we'd be happy for you to come and take care of your pets. And if this happens to you, please keep our number. Here's our number. Here's who we are. Uh, here's our address. So maybe in order to find caregivers, you have to offer to be a caregiver for them first. So they get the idea, ooh, uh, maybe I need a caregiver for my pet too. Uh, you can always go to the Boy or Girl Scouts if you need a daily walk or something. Um, rescues and shelters sometimes have volunteers that will stop by, especially if you have an affinity with the rescue or the shelter. Sometimes the volunteers will you know, be able to help. Um, and as I said before, breed specific rescues in your area will come and help. They'll either come and help, you know, on a daily basis, or they'll come and take the dog, maybe foster it while you're recovering, um, and then bring it back after you're done. But unless you reach out for this before you need it, uh, it can sometimes be problematic to find it when you need it. So the last step is, um, uh, well, the third step, sorry, is addressing the needs of your pet. Uh, I talked about it a little bit. 
you know, when do your pets get heartworm? Um, do your pets have kidney issues? Do they need special food? Are they allergic to barley? Uh, are they good with thunderstorms? Uh, this is the next logical step in making a plan. Uh, giving someone the ability to know what your pet's pet peeves are, no pun intended, is a gold mine for if in fact the pet needs to be rehomed because you've already given that new owner the ability to know how to care for your pet in the most responsive, respectful way because you're gonna tell them, yes, they're afraid of thunder and lightnings. They do not like the mailman. Riding in the car is wonderful to them. It's like, you know, crack cocaine. They love it. Uh, going to the vet, not so much. They're good having their nails done. They're not good having their nails done. Uh, they, you know, do whatever it is they do. There's all sorts of things that you can share with people um, that your pet does that is specifically in your brain. As I said, many slides back, you know, how are they gonna get into your brain if you can't speak either long-term or short-term? You know, if you're in a coma, you're not gonna be able to tell somebody, oh my God, make sure you put the harness on and not the collar because if you put the collar on, they slip the collar, whatever it is. You know, you need to fill in the gaps um, now so that you are prepared when issues arise later. Uh, letting them know what your pets used to is, is a ground, um, a grounding for your pet and a grounding for the person who may take your pet to foster it short-term, long-term. They'll know what to do. I remember um, one of the members of my Irish Setter Club, she was the former president, passed away over uh, Labor Day weekend. She was four days, no one found her. She lived alone. And when people got there, um, the four dogs were in kennels and they were fine. And uh, uh, everyone said, oh my God, um, is this dog in a covered run because she climbs out and runs away? And her brother, who didn't know the dogs, he knew the males from the females, but they're all red. If you know Irish setters, they're all red. They look pretty much alike. Uh, you can tell the boys from the girls, but other than that, not so much. Um, he didn't know that he couldn't put this one dog in the paddock because the dog would take one flying leap and be gone. Uh, so these are the kind of things you need to share with people uh, so that your dogs can remain safe or cats, or birds, or horses. I mean, if your cat is the kind that goes by the window and maybe jumps out, people need to know that. And then I said this at the beginning, and I, I can't reiterate it any more than I can here. You need to publish whatever plan you make, which means the pet care plan is only as good as the people who know you created it and who can follow your directives. So even if they're not the people who are gonna care for your pets, your attorney, your veterinarian, they know you have one and they know that there's going to be um, a plan that is going to be used to help care for this pet. So as the pet owner, you need to alert those who are named as persons required, requested to implement these directives. You need to tell them, as I said before, several of my MAP community members have walked into people's houses and seen their names on the three by five cards on the refrigerator and the person never told them they were putting their name down. Uh, you really need to tell people that they are the caregiver that you're appointing. Um, you need to assure that the right people know about the plan and agree to take on the responsibility to alert those named. So I talked about respond um, redundancy before. So I call it the nosy neighbor. You, you may have a neighbor who can't take care of your pet for one reason or another, but they may be a great person to let them know I have a plan in place for the care of Fluffy. Here it is. If for any reason you see me being rolled out of my apartment or my home and taken by EMTs to the hospital, especially if you live alone, uh, that nosy neighbor can then tell animal care and control who will be called to take your pets because they don't leave pets alone in the house. If that nosy neighbor says, listen, I have a plan right here. It says that I can tell you that I know who the caregivers are for these dogs in the event any something happened to Deborah. And so I'm gonna tell you what she told me and here it is in writing. Um, please don't take the dogs out of the house, leave them here. And then that neighbor can call the three or four people who you know, who you've appointed to care for these dogs who might not live next door. They might live a town over. They might live a state over. Um, I remember that my uh, friend Susie broke her ankle in a field event 
uh, and was laying in the field. And she called me and she goes, I broke my ankle. You're going to have to come and get the dogs. And I said, great. She lives in Maryland. I lived in New York, a little bit of a trip. But she had three people who could take care of the dog short term. Um, and one of them was simply the person who was the nosy neighbor who said, I know who's supposed to take care of these pets, put them in the car. I'm going to drive them home to her house and she'll be there. And sure enough, the short term person, Anne, was there. She came and took care of the dogs until I got there that evening um, or maybe it was the next morning. But these are the kind of things you need to do in order to create that seamless care of your pets if something happens to you. And you need to publish it. You need to assure, really, that all the right people know about the plan. Um, and those people include, believe it or not, not just the caregivers and the nosy neighbor, but your attorney and your veterinarian. It'd be good to let your kennel person and groomer maybe know as well. Your attorney needs to know because, of course, they're going to reimburse the person who's taking care of your pet. And the veterinary needs to know because if that person's name is not on your vet records at the vet, the vet is legally unable to allow that person to bring the pet in to be cared for. I'm going to say that again because it's really important. And this is an AMC um, sponsored event. So they will love me for this. Because if you don't put down in the file that Deborah Hamilton, Susie Smith, Jenny Jones um, are all able to bring Fluffy in for care if something were to happen to me, then when they bring them in, they're not really supposed to take care of them because they're not what's called a member of the veterinary client patient uh, relationship. It's called a VCPR. So you really need to make sure that you let the right people know what it is um, that you've allowed happening to happen with your pets. Um, and also, it's really great to give those people a checklist of what to do in an emergency and PS to have that checklist for yourself as well. Because if, if you're awake, you can say the checklist is in the yellow file by the refrigerator. Make sure you call everybody and get them to do what they're going to do. Remember, if you're with your spouse or your kids, they're going to want to be with you if you're going to the hospital. So being able to have a checklist that they can call, that would be make their life so much easier. It's not like you know trying to figure out what you're going to do. Um, so publishing includes, as I said, your veterinarian of the approved caregivers, um, and the possibility of the animals change in locale if applicable. So Susie's dogs went to New York from Maryland. I mean, I brought them to my vet and then they were under the VCPR of my vet. But I, if I had stayed in Maryland, I was on the file to be on the VCPR for the dogs at Susie's vet. Uh, you want to alert your attorneys because you want to be able to fund the people who are caring for your pet out of your pet trust. Remember, if you put all your money in your will and you're not dead yet, um, the people who are caring for your pet are not going to be paid. And I will tell you something that I've learned from a number of trust and estate attorneys. Uh, the issue is that if you put all your money in your will and it's probated, depending on where you live, it could take a year or two or three to get those funds released to take care of your pets. And maybe with a dog or a cat, that's not so bad. I mean, I can cover that. But with a horse, that's going to be astronomical. And many horses are put in jeopardy because the funds are not released um, early enough to continue to take care of them. Um, and of course, publishing includes telling your caregiver, but also checking in with them and updating them on the care of the pet and confirming that they can still take care of the pet every year. I know this sounds crazy. However, people's lives change. And we don't. if we don't ask them, we don't know. And so maybe I'm a little less firm than I was last year. And if I'm going to walk um, Susie's 80-pound Irish setter, hmm, maybe I can't do that right now. And I feel bad, so I'm not really going to tell her. Well, you have to really check in and make sure that you do know because it's important. So in an emergency, your family and friends need to know who to call. Uh, the person on deck is aware of their role in an emergency. 
the caregivers have access to veterinary care and the caregivers' ex our expenses are easily reimbursed. So, so this is why doing what we've talked about in the last three slides is so important because you wanna make sure that in an emergency, it's seamless. And that's my wonderful baby girl. Um, Dulcinea. She's uh, flying with the angels now, but she was a lovely girl and, and she's there with, uh, I think, Ted and Fred. Um, so remember, the first step you need to take is to decide to navigate the journey your pet will take when you can't care for it short or long term. The next step is to make that plan, make that map plan, which includes sitting down and thinking about the plan realistically that you want to make for your pet, thinking about and appointing and talking with caregivers, making sure you pull all that information out of your head and address the needs of your pet, so important, and then make sure you publish that plan. And that published plan is with your family, your caregivers, your nosy neighbor, best person in the world, I have to tell you, um, your veterinarian, your attorney, your, your groomer, if you want. I mean, they could even be one of your caregivers. A kennel could be one of your caregivers. Um, you need to give that plan to your trust and estate advisor. And the reason I love this plan is because it sits outside your will. It's referred in your will. It's referred to in your will so that you can change it as your pets change. You can add money to your pet trust at any time. Um, I always say a thousand, maybe two thousand, just to get the dog from point A to point B with a bag of food. That's it, because the pet trust will allow you to make sure that the animal um, has money to be the the caregiver has money to care for the animal, um, and your trust and estate advisor will be happy to oversee that. They're not going to oversee your dog, but they'll oversee paying the person who's overseeing your dog, um, and then have them incorporated into your will because you wanna make sure that the MAP plan will come to fruition, either in your will, your pet trust, your living will. Um, it's interesting that most of the time, uh, there's a, a little pushback from trust and estate attorneys for just referring to it um, in your will and referring to it in the pet trust. However, I don't want anyone to have to pay to redo their will or redo their pet trust every time something changes with their pet. So there is a way to do this, and I'm happy to speak to anybody's attorney, um, where you can refer to it in the will and the owner can change it as the pet's life changes. And finally, as I, I've said, publish, publish, publish. Tell everyone you have a plan. I don't care who they are. If you can give them a copy of the plan, that might be good too, so that you know that you've done your best to make sure that what you want to have done with your pet is done. Make sure they know where it is. In our, in our community call, I always say, if you don't want somebody's number up on your refrigerator, just say uh, pet care plan in yellow file on the counter or chartreuse file um, or day glow orange file, whatever, but it's gotta be easy to find. Um, remember to name your caregivers and check with them every year. Um, and what you want done with your pets in an emergency is up to you to decide. So now we have, oh, about seven minutes left. Um, I would love to take questions. Um, and it, if you want, this is my contact information, but I know that you'll be getting this. So um, I will leave it here. Um, Kim or Maria, do we have any questions that came in? I see 30 in the chat, but I'm not sure if they're all questions. We do have some questions, but I'm actually curious, Maria, can you share the poll results from what we took oh, earlier? Thank Let's you, see. yes. Yes, that is fabulous. <laughs> so let's see where everybody was when they first started. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, so is everyone seeing this? Yes, there we go. Perfect. Um, so do you have a pet covered in your will? So at least 70% of everyone who is here at the beginning does not have anything in their will about their pets. I'm so glad that 30% have um, something in their will, but remember you have to die um, and I don't want any of you to die. So we have to get something outside of your will as well. Um, so stop share next one. Oh, share results. Oh, here you are. Sorry about that. Um, do you have pets covered in your will? Okay, next one. So I'm sharing the results. How much money would you leave? So most of you want to leave 20 or 40 grand, which is nice. Um, that's fine. And that could go into your will. 
Uh, but in your pet trust, I would leave about a thousand or two thousand um, dollars, maybe if you have a lot of animals, five or ten, uh, because you really want the person to be doing it because they love the dog and they love you, not because they're going to have a windfall. Um, that's why I put that question in there. Um, share results. Did I not share results? I thought I did. Okay, here we go. So this is the result. So 4%, say about 1,000 or 2,000, you guys win, because I think that in the pet trust, uh, that's the right amount. In a will, you might want to leave 5,000 or 10,000 or 20 or 40,000, depends on how many dogs you want. Um, and, and really the person should be in it for the care of the pet, um, not the, uh... okay. So um, I can't get to the next poll question. There we go. I don't know if you can see the share results. Um, do you have a pet trust set up to share, to care for your pets? Um, well, there's 88% um, said no. Uh, the pet trust is your best friend. Call up your trust and estate attorney today and say, or tomorrow and say, I need a pet trust because I need something that's going to kick in immediately if something happens to me, uh, either if it's short-term or long-term. It shouldn't be that much. I know you're all mostly in New York, so it'll be a little more expensive, but it really is money well spent to set up a pet trust um, and make sure you talk to your um, attorney about that. And then talk to them about the plan that you might want to make for your pet. Um, and you might've already made a plan in your will because some of you, 9% said you have a plan in your will. Uh, however, you might be able to pull a lot of that information out and put it into your map plan so that it's available to everyone um, in the event something happens to you. Okay, so the next poll, who will care for your pets if you get sick? So family, we know the family will, but if you're sick, they're gonna to wanna to be with you. I'm just gonna share that with you as I found out with my husband, um, or they're not gonna be able to, as my sons and my husband told me when I broke my ankle. So just, that's a really good group to rely on, but I wouldn't put them um, as the only caregivers. Friends are great, neighbors are great. Um, I often talk about um, breeders or breed rescue or the rescue you, you got your pet from. They're always the best last resort. Um, there's also a number of rescues who you can set up a plan with who will care for your pets. Um, you give them a certain amount of money and they'll care for your pets for the rest of your pet's life um, or try to find them a, a great home. Uh, so that's always uh, a possibility, but you're right. Family and friends are usually the people, but remember that nosy neighbor, really important. Next question. Do you have written directions? Yes, great. Well, I hope you have written directions and that you've published them, not that you've written them and you haven't given them to the people who need to know. Um, but there's 67% uh, who haven't written down those directions. Um, so I hope tonight helped you to recognize why it's so important to write those directions down because the care of your pet is in your head as opposed to in someone else's head. And if you want the care to be maintained at a certain level, you really need to let people know. Um, next. Or is that the last one? I think that was the last that one. That was the last Perfect. one. Awesome, thank you guys. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes, yeah, so we did have um, a couple of questions. And the first one that I'm going to ask is, this was included in one of your slides, but can you explain the difference between a pet trust versus a pet protection agreement? Um, well, my wonderful friend who passed away made the pet protection um, agreement. So that is something that's like a pet trust, only it um, doesn't have the, sometimes there's a little legality if someone has financial issues, if they're your trustee in the pet trust. So the pet protection agreement was supposed to be able to um, uh, alleviate that issue. Uh, but either one, they're sort of the same. They both set up the care of your pet outside your will. Um, so either one, um, Rachel, mm, can't remember her last name, my apologies. Uh, but if you email me, I'm happy to um, tell you the name of the book. And uh, it's Petriarch is the name of the book, Petriarch. And she sets forth all of the uh, needs of pets Um for the care long-term, short-term. Um, and she was the one who created the pet protection agreement. And she said she has never had any court 
uh, deny the care of the pet under the pet protection agreement. The pet trust is the one that has now been approved in 50 states and attorneys are more uh, familiar with that, but the pet protection agreement you can do yourself um, and then give to your attorney um, or you can just uh, ask your attorney to do a pet, pet trust where you're going to put about one or $2,000 to make sure the pet can get from point A to point B. Does that answer your question? Um, I hope. Yeah. And so a follow-up question to that is, how do you set up a pet trust fund? Is it like an escrow account with authorized users or an executor who does not have to be an attorney? That would be um, the greatest question for you to ask your attorney who is doing your trust in the state. Mm -hmm. It could be any of the above. Uh, so even though I'm an attorney in New York and I likely can answer that question, I always punt uh, when people ask me that because it you really need um, a a trust and estate advisor to help you build this in a way that's going to make sense for you with the amount of money and how to access that money. I always want someone um, independent uh, to do the payments uh, for the caregiver, uh, not that the caregiver has access, um, and also that will you know, routinely check in on the pet or have someone check in on the pet to make sure the pet's um, still being cared for. It could either be the longest lived pet or the shortest lived pet. So you really need to make sure you have someone checking in. And then how do you arrange for temporary caregivers to be reimbursed if you fall ill? Is that under the pet trust as well? That would be uh, absolutely. That's why you want a pet trust. So if it's in your will, there's you know no temporary payment set up. Um, there's no money set aside. Uh, the pet trust gives you the opportunity to do that. Um, you know, your power of attorney could also pay the person, but there's no you know amount set up. There's no agreement to how much someone will be paid. Uh, there's there's nothing tangible, so it it could be the sky's the limit. Uh, which is why you want to set up something that says, well, if you take my dog, it's, you know, and it's not a family member. Um, usually, in my experience, it's it's been either a family member or a friend or a neighbor, and they take the dog and, you know, whenever they need a bag of food, they call you. Uh, they don't charge you $30 a day, but sometimes if you have to give it to a kennel or you have to give it to a dog walker, it's going to be a certain charge a day. So you have to make sure you uh, prepare for that. And um, what do you recommend for people who don't have anyone uh, willing to take care of their pet, either for a long sickness or a hospital stay or a death? Like who who do you, they reach out to, do you recommend? So remember that three by five card I did in Pleasantville? Um, so that's what you need to do. Uh, there is someone, and if, if your pet, I have a member of my MAP community whose pet can't be touched because it bites everyone. Um, and she says the same thing to me. She goes, I have nobody. And I said, well, you better find somebody. I said, because if something happens to you um, or your son or your husband, you, you really need to make sure that there's somebody who can come in and take care of your dog. Uh, so that's when you look at who's in your building, who's in your neighborhood with pets, drop off that three by five card and say, listen, you know, in case something happens, um, I live down the street, I walk the red dog. Um, if you need any help, please, you know, get in touch with me. Um, or if you go to a vet, which most of you probably do, uh, talk up the vet techs. Um, they like to make a little extra money and it would behoove you to have them come over, you know, once or twice a month just to get to know your pet so that God forbid something happens to you. Uh, they, know your dog uh, more than just at the vet when they might not be their best selves. Um, and then there's the groomers. Um, and, and then there's, you know, the high school, um, you know, kids who are in for pre-vet or something, or just love animals. Uh, it, it takes a little more time if you don't know anyone, but I can tell you that if you take the dog to the park and you meet people every day who are walking dogs, start that conversation. If you take them to the dog park where you let them all run, um, start that conversation. Uh, and then you all can be an heir and a spare for all the dog park people, um, especially if your dog loves the dog. I remember I gave a talk out in La Jolla, California to an independent living um, group 
there were about 400 people living in this building and some of them had pets. And they said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, do you know anyone? Well, you know, Fluffy really likes this young guy's um, dog at the dog park. I said, well, ask him. He goes, yeah, but I don't want to take care of his dog. I said, well, ask him anyway. He might not want you to take care of his dog, but if he could take care of your dog, if you got sick, that would be great. And the dogs get along. I mean, you just have to start that conversation. It's, it behooves you. It's, it's an imperative because if you don't, and you get sick, you can't start that conversation. And then the dog's future or the cat's future, the bird, the horse, you know, is sort of tenuous. All right. Well, um, I just want to say thank you so much, Deborah, uh, for speaking on such an important topic with our audience tonight. I'm also going to say thank you to Maria for helping out with our logistics. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us. A recording of tonight's lecture is going to be uploaded to our YouTube channel and we'll send out the link to all registered participants once it's available to watch in case you missed anything or would like to watch again. Uh, Deborah, thank you again. I mean, this was this information was invaluable and um, re we're so glad that you were able to join us tonight and share it with uh, the Schwartzman Animal Medical Center audience. So um, thank you and thanks to all of you and have a great rest of your night, everybody. Thanks everyone and take good care. Um, and thanks to the AMC, so glad to be here.